A lot's been uh, talked about about the, uh, the administrative burden created by the, um, the EU um, and how the EU gold plates um, the standards, um, particularly in relation to uh, um, shipping le uh, legislation um, and in the maritime sector, which is otherwise governed, um, many would say, fairly inadequately by uh, the IMO and others um, on an international basis. So um, looking at that and how um, much has been made of the opportunities to cut through the red tape, um, uh, we've been trying to identify what might be uh, cut away um, by the UK uh, post-EU. Um, and unfortunately, there is quite a lot of uh, the, the regulation which is necessary. The gold plating, the gold standards, is something that we, I suspect, do not want to give up that, um, that easily. Ship safety... Um, environmental regulations and anything that deals with crew welfare, I can't imagine that um, any government is going to find um, particularly easy to, um, to tear up and, uh, and move away from. That said, of course, there is going to be a lot of streamlining when we get into the, uh, the real detail. Um, and it, this is a process of trying to identify that. And for us, um, as lawyers, working out uh, what works for um, businesses, what works for um, the industry as a whole, um, and trying then to uh, implement that, helping uh, everybody in this room uh, to lobby government um, and uh, press through something that works for the, uh, uh, the industry as a whole, uh, making sure that we can make um, uh, the UK a far stronger maritime economy um, as perhaps it, it once was. Um, if we look at the legal aspects in the in the short term, I'm afraid I don't have uh, particularly uh, good news. There's a lot of uncertainty, and so we we want to uh, caution uh, people uh, in relation to that. I mean, if you look at um, contracts in particular, there'll be a lot of contracts that uh, uh, are ongoing. Um, they're going to be for periods um, over the two years. Uh, depending on when, of course, Article 50 is uh, invoked. But any co um, contracts um, or trade deals that uh, require or rely on EU regulations need to be looked at in the context of a, a possible frustration uh, or force majeure argument. Um, issues in relation to currency fluctuations, payment clauses, um, and jurisdictional um, issues as a whole um, are, are all going to create an element of uncertainty, and they need to be examined uh, fairly, fairly clearly and carefully. I mean, much of our jurisdictional um, uh, law comes from uh, EU conventions. Even the Lugano Convention uh, is our, our, our signatory to that is via our EU membership. So, do we query need to become a signatory in our own right? Um, if we look back at the old law. Um, Pre-EU, um, looking at the uh, Rome II regulations in relation to uh, tort claims, um, reverting to the law of the country in which the, the tort occurred, um, jurisdictional battles that took place in relation to those, um, service of proceedings um, can be notoriously difficult if they're done through the Foreign um, Commonwealth Office, uh, enforcement of judgments. Um, we have the, uh, uh, the recast Brussels uh, regulation where they're automatically enforceable at the moment, reverting to a, a subsequent determination um, of the substance of a dispute is um, unattractive. Um, the reality, of course, is that it's also going to be un unattractive to the rest of the EU. So one would hope that there are elements um, of any agreement and leaving the EU um, where uh, the reciprocity that we have negotiated or have developed over the years um, can be maintained. And I would have thought that that would be an easy one, but um, I'm not a politician. Um, in the meantime, we're advising clients to review their contracts um, and uh, make sure that uh, where possible they use arbitration clauses where there is a regime that um, is uh, available that falls outside of the EU uh, regulations. Uh, what then for the opportunities... Well, uh, amongst the doom and gloom, there is, of course, uh, a, a huge uh, opportunity. 
Um, if we look at um, the, the tonnage uh, figures, international tonnage has grown 34% since 2009. Um, but conversely, uh, UK tonnage has shrunk by 27% in that same period. So what can we do um, to try and reinvigorate uh, the UK as a, um, as a flag? We're, we look and we advise, as a, a law firm, we, we advise um, a number of flag states in their legislation, streamlining, trying to make it attractive to um, blue chip uh, ship owners, um, bringing them to a particular flag state um, and encourage uh, that into their economy. So there's no reason we can't do that um, for the UK as well. What's the primary uh, um, uh, driver, though? Of course, it's going to be money. Um, the tonnage tax has been uh, much uh, debated in, in recent years. Um, if you look at Singapore as a maritime nation and how it attracts business in, of course, the pro predominant driver is uh, um, a very, very favourable uh, um, uh, tax regime. And so if, we have, um, if we're free of the EU rules against uh, state aid, um, stopping the distortion of trade within the EU, then um, there is an opportunity there to um, lend uh, or give uh, tax breaks rather to uh, um, the, uh, the maritime sector. Um, Greece and Cyprus managed to create a tax efficient system, uh, maybe uh, um, without need to uh, leave the EU, but uh, certainly Singapore finds it um, a a attractive uh, or, or is able to make it more attractive uh, elsewhere. Um, the, the insurance sector uh, is, is one um, which has been uh, talked about a lot, in, uh, certainly in, in our circles, our, our firm. Um, passporting in, in particular is a major um, issue, and of course I think everyone realises that uh, what would be ideal is a, a mutual recognition system along the same lines. Uh, there were, of course, pre-passporting licences um, that had been negotiated by Lloyds and others um, pre-EU. And so there's no reason to assume that we, we couldn't go back to that system if we, if we had to. But in the, uh, um, in the short term, it's going to be quite a, uh, um, a difficult process of negotiating those. Um, but perhaps it'll be easier than uh, I'm envisaging. But um, uh, my, my experience leads me to think that uh, th those sort of um, licensing issues uh, may be more involved than uh, at first um, envisaged. Um, P&I clubs uh, maybe uh, need some protection um, in, in that respect. Um, there are various representatives from the clubs in the, uh, in the room. Um, but there are also opportunities because um, Solvency 2 is a piece of legislation, although driven by um, the UK, um, is a one-size-fits-all piece of legislation. And um, a piece of legislation that works for uh, mainstream insurers doesn't necessarily work for uh, the mutuals, um, who don't necessarily hold capital in the same way. They have free reserves, um, they have a right to make additional calls, and um, there may be a way of um, having a completely separate regime for uh, P&I clubs, which would um, uh, help them um, with their business. Um, but, but in short, again, we, we are trying to encourage everybody um, in the insurance industry to have their, um, their plan B in place. Um, it was rather worrying to, uh, uh, to, to hear about the, uh, the politics and you know, the, uh, the, the issues that may well be facing uh, our politicians in Europe. And there may be a possibility of, of not arriving at a, um, at a deal. So that plan B needs to be in, um, in place. The, the, the one good thing is, particularly with the insurance industry, is that um, uh, there are lots of in, uh, European insurers that are um, operating in the UK using Lloyds as their, um, as their platform. Also, um, we have a specialist uh, maritime uh, insurance uh, um, uh, expertise within the UK, and it is in everyone's interests, uh, whether they be UK or, uh, or European or international, to maintain that. Um, and for, uh, for, for uh, those sort of, uh, that business to continue and to flourish. Um, but if you look at uh, maybe other 
um, slightly offbeat um, industries, the offshore sector, um, again, has been flagged. Um, we, we're seeing quite a, a growth in decommissioning with the oil price um, low as it is. Um, so there is a huge opportunity in the, uh, in the North Sea, whereas most of the um, major maritime contractors seem to be based in Rotterdam um, or, or elsewhere. And again, we have that opportunity to try and encourage them to base themselves in the UK, particularly to take advantage of the, uh, the decommissioning, build that expertise. Um, there was a phenomenal amount of money that's going to be ploughed into that over the, uh, uh, the, the coming decade. Um, and, uh, I mean, again, whilst I, I don't think uh, we want to uh, detract from the environmental considerations and legislation um, that, that has been built up, uh, the Prime Minister has already done away with uh, the Department for uh, Energy and Climate Change, so perhaps set out her stall that life is going to be a little easier um, uh, post, um, uh, post-Brexit or, or indeed uh, with the new government. Um, if, we, if we think about decommissioning and then uh, there is a, a logical adjunct with um, uh, ship recycling, um, we have the Basel Convention, the Hong Kong Convention that uh, regulates that from an international perspective, but also the EU regulation, um, which again gold plates the, uh, um, the international standards. And EU vessels have got to be uh, recycled at approved facilities, um, either within the EU or um, outside it. Um, if, they, if they fall outside the EU, then they've got to be approved by the EU Commission. Again, coming out of uh, um, uh, the EU red tape allows us to uh, look um, uh, more favourably at that, and uh, that will pre- present a, a, an opportunity, a cost-effective opportunity for people undertaking decommissioning work um, in the North Sea. Um, then uh, that, that sort of uh, led me to think about um, uh, customs, of course, uh, that there are um, uh, currently um, a lot of uh, ship recycling, sorry, um, uh, EU waste uh, directives, etc., um, which regulate the, uh, the movement of other wastes, um, non, non-ship recycling, um, some of which uh, attract um, import or, uh, or customs duties and other um, charges, depending on the movement. Um, uh, we're going to have to have a new customs code um, in the UK. Um, the, uh, the World Customs Organization regulates much of it, but um, uh, we, we still are allowing uh, ourselves uh, the opportunity to um, streamline that. We, we need to uh, develop a system that does uh, cater for the fast movement of goods. Um, and the, uh, um, uh, the uh, British uh, um, uh, Freight Association, International Freight Association, says that uh, this is an, uh, an opportunity to abolish the uh, um, interest stat returns, which they say are unnecessary uh, in administrative uh, burdens. Um, if we were able to introduce a, a single multimodal system of electronic declarations, um, again, there is, there is that opportunity that we could pr- um, promote a, uh, a gateway into Europe um, receiving um, goods into uh, the UK and then uh, on shipping them into Europe if the, uh, if the system is um, swift and smooth. Uh, personally, I think that's a bit of a stretch, but um, if all of the other stars aligned, um, then who knows, there is that, there is that opportunity. Um, the, again, the, the, the emissions, um, EU emissions regulation uh, 2015 757, um, uh, which created the, uh, the MRV framework, um, is, is what has been seen as a, uh, an additional um, uh, level of, uh, of red tape. But um, we, were, we were talking and discussing about it in the, in the office um, to see if, you know, hypothetically, one might um, have uh, ships coming into the uh, the UK on a, uh, shall we say, a, a, a more emissions friendly regime, uh, and then for uh, transshipment to take place um, on shipment into the uh, EU. But the reality is, I think that um, 
uh, fuel prices, etc., um, need to uh, increase dramatically before we look at um, uh, a break-even point on that. But uh, um, it's for for others to uh, to run the sums. Um, the, uh, the 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 final element, I think, where um, there is again um, an opportunity to uh, to streamline is the EU ports and services regulation, uh, predominantly aimed at um, state-owned ports um, throughout the EU, um, whereas, of course, 75% of uh, UK ports are already privately owned, and they see that um, as a... Uh, they see that regulation um, as less relevant and, again, increasing the, uh, the regulation upon them. So um, uh, stepping away from that um, provides a... Uh, um, uh, an opportunity again to become uh, more competitive uh, in the wider world. Uh, I, th I think, um, by way of summary, there, there are fantastic opportunities. Um, we, as a firm, are uh, very cautiously optimistic, should we say, um, for the uh, uh, for the outcome. And uh, it's about seizing those opportunities, working out how we can create the efficiencies. Um, and putting them to uh, um, to government um, uh, in such a way that they can uh, they can listen and act on it. Thank you very much. Thank you.